In Unit 1, I made a pretty big reference to the concept that the sole purpose of the upper limb is in positioning of the hands, and that the shoulder and elbow joints assisted with this functionality. For Unit 2, we can think of the lower limb and its respective joint as serving in the positioning of the entire body through walking and running. Now that we have a pretty good idea of the muscles and compartments of the thigh in place, it's time to take a look at the joints that facilitate this movement, starting with the hip. Good day, and welcome to today's video lecture. With the bones and the muscles of the thigh in place, we can start to consider the structures of some of the joints of the lower limb, starting with the hip. The hip is a multi-axial ball and socket joint between the head of the femur and the acetabulum of the ox coxae. Now, unlike the shoulder joint, however, the contact between the head and the socket is remarkably deep, which gives it incredible support, but also a great deal of movement. The objective for this session is to describe the joint structure and permissive movements, as well as to consider a few clinical issues related to the hip joint. As described at the outset, the hip is the articulation between the head of the femur and the acetabular fossa. More specifically, the lunate surface of the acetabular fossa. Despite the fact that only a portion of the acetabulum makes contact with the femoral head, more than half of the femoral head is still in articular contact with the acetabulum at any given moment. This is in part assisted by the presence of the acetabular labrum, which deepens the joint and increases the surface area contact, similar to the glenoid labrum at the shoulder. The hip is reinforced by an exceptionally strong joint capsule, projecting from the outer rim of the acetabulum to the intertrochanteric line and crest along the femur. This is in contrast to the rather weak joint capsule seen at the shoulder. This strength is the result of three strong reinforcing bands of intracapsular ligaments, named for the three bones of the os coxae. Pound for pound, the iliofemoral ligament is the strongest in the body. It runs from the outer rim of the acetabulum up to the AIIS, anterior inferior iliac spine, and spirals down anteriorly to the intertrochanteric line. Its fibers divide, forming transverse and descending bands that give it its nickname, the Y ligament. From the posterior aspect of the acetabular rim, the triangular ischiofemoral ligament winds anteriorly, blending with those of the transverse band of the iliofemoral ligament at the intertrochanteric line. Together, the iliofemoral and ischiofemoral ligaments work together to prevent hyperextension through a corkscrew mechanism. As the fibers spiral around the joint, extension of the hip stresses these ligaments, which pull the articular surfaces closer together, strengthening their association. These ligaments loosen during flexion of the joint, permitting greater amounts of rotation between the loosened joint surface. Note that the flexion is principally limited by soft tissue approximation rather than ligament tension. The posterior capsule is sufficiently weak to allow protrusion of the synovial capsule and a small bursal sac. The pubofemoral ligament originates off the inferior pubofemoral crest. Unlike the other two ligaments, it is primarily involved in limiting hyperabduction and dislocation of the femoral head during the action of performing the splits. An additional ligament, the ligamentum capitis femoris, literally the ligament to the head of the femur, is also worthy of notice. As previously explained, the acetabular notch generates a space between the femoral head and acetabulum, with the inferior margin reinforced by the transverse acetabular ligament. The ligamentum capitis projects to the head within this space. Its role in reinforcing the joint is minimal, as it has very little structural strength. It does, however, serve to protect a very important vascular structure encased within. This is aptly named the artery to the head of the femur, responsible for providing the head with much of its vascular supply. Damage to the ligamentum capitis femoris, and therefore to the artery to the head of the femur, can have dire consequences. No one knows this better than famed athlete Bo Jackson former running back for the Los Angeles Raiders, made famous for playing professional baseball concurrently with the Kansas City Royals.
in the 1991 AFC Divisional Playoff match between the Raiders and the Cincinnati Bengals, Bo Jackson was carrying the ball when linebacker Kevin Walker made a shoestring tackle to tip Jackson up at the 45-yard line. The tackle looked innocent enough at the time. The commentators theorized that Jackson had pulled a muscle. What no one realized at the time is that this marked the end of Bo Jackson's professional football career. In just over a year's time, the 30-year-old would undergo hip replacement surgery. So what happened? How did such an innocent-looking play have such a devastating effect? To better understand, let's slow down the video to the moment of injury, right here. Although subtle looking, Jackson was running with such force that this awkward plant put sufficient force through the femur to posteriorly dislocate the femoral head from the acetabular fossa, something that normally requires the intensity of a car accident to occur. Although the hip relocated and Bo eventually left the field on his own power, although gingerly, the damage was done. He had damaged the ligament and thus the artery to the head of the femur. The result was a vascular necrosis to the head of the femur and a rapidly progressing degeneration that required hip replacement. You can see the results in both CT and MRI, as well as cadaveric studies, where the area of necrotic tissue is apparent. Jackson was ultimately able to return to baseball for a brief period, but would never return to the football field. We can identify a number of anatomical structures in a plain film radiograph of the hip. The cup of the acetabulum can be seen as the fusion between the ilium, ischium, and pubic bone. The head of the femur sits deep into this fossa. We can see the fovea on the femoral head where the round ligament attaches. Moving distally, we see the neck of the femur, greater and lesser trochanters, and the intertrochanteric crest. Also note that the sacroiliac joint is also visible in this radiographic view. Just in case you're wondering, the dark shadow you see over this region is an air pocket within the intestinal tissue, suggesting that the patient was a little gassy. That'll do it for our discussion of the hip joint. On the other side of the break, we'll switch our attention over to the knee joint and some of the most common injuries seen there. See you then. <laughs> 